He's the man behind the freestyle. A member of the Ricky Smiley Morning Show, Ed Crack puts his love for the culture on display with the flow and go freestyle session with the brat and his introduction to some of the game's live as MC. But if you look closer, you'll see a triple threat on the rise. From radio to TV to the stage is one third of the Bodega Bro. The boy is for sure 456. He is head crack. This is free lunch. Go. Get some. Y'all in the winning circle, try some squares though You in the killing fields, ignoring the scarecrows Yeah ho, I'm Benny Blanco in the last scene Making the power play high off of caffeine This is a tag team, fair to see the bad dream The male version of Carrie killing the glass queen Bati bloggers quit dodging my emails Take yeah. that whack shit off, the real yeah. revamp <laughs> Welcome to the Free Lunch Podcast, home of the New South Movement and the New South Movement Network. This is your boy, Tight, one half of the Free Lunch Podcast duo. I got the main man, B. Jeezy, with me. B. Jeezy, what's happening? You know what it is, BG the 27 kid in lovely Atlanta, Georgia, Free Lunch Podcast. What's happening in it? Man, we're in the home. We're in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Home of the Falcons, the Dirty Bird. Call. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can already hear this is gonna be an entertaining interview and podcast. Uh we got a legend uh of of of, of radio personality. We got a hip hop underground battle rap guru. Uh I was gonna read his bio off his off the home page, but it seemed like he wrote it. Only thing I got from it was he's a unicorn, and I'm gonna leave it like that. In a in a world full of wild horses, I'm a unicorn. You a unicorn? Why and not? And y'all know and y'all know the voice. Yo, people, because people get unicorns messed up. Like they, oh, it's such a beautiful creature. Do you realize that's a knife at the head of that <laughs> the head unicorn head? head? Unicorn, oh, unicorn it looks, dangerous. Looks pretty, but it's pretty dangerous, man. Try to kiss a unicorn. See what happens. You get brained. <laughs> yeah, and, and y'all know the voice. It's the man head crap from the Rick and Smiley Morning Show. Peace. Also. Uh, uh, the uh, Bodega Bravas. Yeah, Bodega. Uh, we definitely want to get into both of those, man. But okay. I got a, I got a quick question for you. Yes, sir. So this morning, and and I listen to the radio show, the uh, Ricky Smiley Morning Show, frequently, uh, daily listener. Y'all do a segment where y'all call heaven. Right. Are you the Michael Jackson voice? No, man. <laughs> I wish I was that talented. I am the worst at impressions because, like, it always starts off good. Then it goes from, like, you know, an impression to a Jamaican to an Irishman to an Australian. I, am, I, I, do, like, I cannot stay in character Consistent. for long periods of time. Like, you know, I recently did an episode of the TV show Archer that comes okay. on FX. Thank God it was a short part because, like, my voice had no, op, you know, no chance to change octaves in between, like, the takes. So, like, that was it. But now, nah, like, all, every character you hear when we call heaven is all the work of one person. Really? Yeah. I don't think he wants his name out nah. there. No, nah, I don't but know. But it. it's all one dude. And this dude is so talented. So talented. But it's, it's all one dude, man. The guy's a mad man. That's And that's kind of the unique thing about that whole show is that everybody is just so talented in their very own way. The, how, does that, how, how does that feel to be in that room on a day-to-day basis with all that talent? And you know, it's ill because, like, the whole show is like a Swiss Army knife. For real. It you know really what I'm saying? Is. Like, you know, hey, you, uh, we need a corkscrew. Get this bottle open. Uh, we need a knife to cut this open. We need a Phillips head flute driver. Uh, Gary, you'll be the flathead. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, everybody contributes something to the situation. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, I try to keep everybody abreast on pop culture, hip hop news, what's going on with your favorite rappers, what new songs right. dropping. Gary got the gossip and the tea. You know, Ricky Smiley, of course, got the comedy and the prank phone calls. Special K, he's shooting from the grassy knoll. Rock T's keeping you covered with the mm-hmm. sports. Yeah. The brat, um, you know, we're still figuring out, you know, all the skills that she has too, because like, you know, like she's a great personality, personality. an amazing voice, and has is so well traveled. You know, she could t- kind of tell you a little bit about everything. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, it's almost like getting a new toy or getting a new feature or lever- leveling up in a game. Mm-hmm. And like, okay, now, all right, cool. Now we got these new powers. So like, you know, so the show is definitely up a you. notch, you know, adding a breath. And I can it. remember when she when she, she came on as a guest one, right. one episode. And it was like, it was so natural. You could, you could just kind of feel the chemistry. Mm-hmm. And she ended up being a... A part of the team, so yeah, you know, like it was, it was an interesting time when she came in too, because yeah, like, you know, yeah, because you know, we had Claudia, uh-huh. you know, who I think um, I don't really think she was given a fair chance to do well. You know, what I'm saying like, I think 
sometimes people need somebody to hate, and it was just easy to hate her because she came after someone who was so well liked. And that's a, yeah, that's you know a good what I'm question. saying. Like people love Ebony, yeah, and um, you know, and like to follow that. No matter who you put in that seat right it's after Ebony, I think they was going to have a tough time, and it just happened to be Claudia. Like, And it's messed up because like, even – I don't watch Real Housewives of Atlanta, but I, I did watch one episode, and it's like crazy because like a little bit – the little bit I saw is like, I don't know these people. You know, because they're not like that in real life. Right. You, know, like, you know, as it relates to like Claudia and Portia and uh, you know some of the other people I've dealt with. I think Candy's pretty much the same. She's so mm-hmm. like she's so even Steven. But uh, you know, but like, you know, I just like I think between the real housewives of Atlanta and just like, you know, just stories that, you know, people made you know, made up on like the internet and stuff like that, I just think people just whatever reason didn't like Make Claudia. it hard. Yeah. And and also when she came on, you know, a lot of people knew her from uh, the Foxhole. Right. Which is satellite right. radio, you can say whatever you want, right. talk greasy, and mm-hmm. then like on terrestrial radio, it's a little bit of a different animal. So, you know, so I think a lot of people who were fans of her from that were like, yo, where's that Claudia at? But, you know, but like, you know, so the year was up in steps the brat, you know, you know, I think the person after the person always has a better, better chance than the, the person shot. after the first person. That took so. that dagger. The first yeah. person take that take the arrows, boy. I, I did solicit a few of our listeners and that was one question that, that they, they asked me they wanted me to ask you was what happened with Ebony? Man, you're, I, you're, 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 I I completely I am not really at the liberty to speak about that. You know what I'm saying? Cause oh, I like, get it. I get it. You know, because it, it's such a complex puzzle. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know, I don't want to paint anybody in a negative light on any side of that mm-hmm. argument. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, like you know, like you know, it happens. You know, sometimes like you know, like business, business relationships just sure. don't work out, even though it seems like they should, or no matter how long they've been rolling. But like the cool thing about Ebony, she's talented. And you're going to see her again, you know, on something mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe sooner than later. You know what I right, mean? So, right. so yeah, yeah. Don't don't cry for her, Argentina. She's going to be back. Yeah. <laughs> she's been doing it for a long time because, in, in, you know, being from Alabama, in Birmingham, they were on the morning show yeah. way back when on, on radio. And we would wake up to them in high school and they had it going on. So, yeah, she'll, she'll be fine. She'll be back. Yeah. But uh, let, let, let's get into your journey because we don't want to talk about... Uh, any of those other personalities. We really wanted to have you on the show and really uh, g- allow you to walk us through your journey to to even how you got to the morning show Word. and even with your even with your um, even with your group that you that you're a member of. Uh, I do remember you saying that that you all were in the, in the midst of signing a big deal. Yeah. So I don't know if that's gone down yet, but you can definitely break it on our podcast. We love to, okay, love I mean, to break uh, that news on the podcast. I mean, shoot, by the time this all airs, man, um, the ink should be dry. You know, okay. the paper is on the table. Okay. People are shaking the pens out right now to get the ink ready to go. And it's, in a real, it's a real sweet deal. And, like, and we have a plan B even for if the plan A magically doesn't go through. But everything is looking sweet. Everything is looking lovely. And uh, we just can't wait to get this music out to the world because, mm-hmm. like, all we do is record and create. Like, you know, it's 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 therapy for us. You for know, enough. like, you know, group and solo. Because, um, you know, radio is great, but it, it's so limiting because, like, radio is what radio is. It's a very uh, one-dimensional medium. Like, you know, you can only hear it. But, like, when you do music, though, you can, like, you have the power. You have the power to change the world with music, you know, like and and get people through the darkest moments of their lives, man. And like with this album we're getting ready to put out uh, called LGA, Loaded Guns and Alcohol. I really feel like um, when people hear it, they'll hear what we were going through when we were making the album and connect with it on so many different levels. Because it's not an album about partying at all. It's not. It, but I mean, they're they're, rec- they're fun records on there. Fun records on there, but like it's not an album to make the latest dance to. Mm-hmm. It is not an album to uh, throw money at strippers to. Well, maybe one song, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, but even even that record ain't that record. You know, right. it doesn't come across like that record. Like mm-hmm. you like the beat and you'll dig what we're saying. Like you know, it's one of the albums when you listen to it from beginning to end, you will either go do something productive that day. You're gonna run harder in the gym. You're gonna mm-hmm. go to work sharper than you were when you uh, before right. you uh, before you listened to it. It's like, damn it, man! It's it's almost like a book, but it's an album. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. With stories and like, and and Trojan horse information Mason. that comes off as one Which thing. Is what you like, mean. oh wow, oh that's what they meant. 
Nice. You know what I'm saying? The so double entendre. I, we can't put it out fast enough, to be honest with you. How did you come up with the, the, the name, Loaded Guns and Alcohol? Yo, that was all Keynote's doing. And, uh, I, I, and I remember it so vividly because I was leaving the house and I was getting ready to jump on 285 from the crib. And he's like, yo, got an idea for the album. What? Yo, we should call it Loaded Guns and Alcohol. And like, I already saw the picture in my head. Because like, when you combine the two things... It is the worst combination, combination of, things of things ever. And I think the world at this current time is being ran by the worst combinations of things ever. Like, you know, like from the standpoint of how, like, you know, gun lobbyists have like their foot on the necks of all these different politicians, mm-hmm. how alcohol is, you know, it, it gets people through their their issues and their problems and you know people use that as a coping mechanism and you factor drugs in as well uh it's just the problem is loaded guns drugs and alcohol doesn't have the same ring as loaded guns and alcohol so we left the drugs out but right. same thing man like you know we uh, so many people self medicate and try to detach from the world chemically and these things make our world spin. And it's funny how, like, things change and certain things get vilified more than others. Like, you know, like, you know, back in the, the 70s and the 60s, oh, man, like, you know, like, it was cocaine time. Everybody was doing cocaine because no one knew cocaine was bad for them. Mm-hmm. Then you realize that cocaine was bad for them, and then it became vilified. And then you fast forward 20 years, everybody's taking pills. Not really realizing the pills are just as bad as the cocaine we were vilifying in the 60s and the 70s and going into the early 80s. So people are kind of swapping out drugs it's every generation. Cycle. It's a, it's a cycle. vicious cycle. It's a cycle. Like you're getting to a point now where like heroin use is back on the rise. Do you guys know how many steps goes into using heroin? You know what I'm saying? But like everything has, it has a flow and a swing to it, man. So like we're trying to make this album your alcohol or your drug. Like listen to it once or twice a week. Get pumped up, change the world, repeat and rinse. You know, mm-hmm. so hopefully that's what we can do with this record. Man, that's what's up. I, let's take it even back further. You from Brooklyn? No, I'm from Bronx. the Bronx. You're from the Bronx. Everybody won't put me in Brooklyn. My mom's from, from Brooklyn. Bronx. No, okay. my mother's from okay. Fort Greene. Okay, okay. Well, take us back to them Bronx days. Take us back Yo. to that time growing up. Uh, the scene set the scene for us with with the hip hop music. Um, and how you even got into like loving hip hop and 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 wanting to be a personality, et cetera? Got you, man. Like you know, at the time I was growing up in New York, um, it was hip hop was still new, young, and fresh, man. It was like the new girl in school. Like everybody wanted to holler at it, you know. And just to hear it evolve on the radio from being like this dirty little secret that was played at night after twelve midnight with like Red Alert and Chuck Chill Out and you know the Awesome Two to being this thing where like there's stations that are like that's the thing with a hip hop station right. you know what i'm saying right. like it was amazing to watch that transition because like you know there used to be stations whose whose whole thing was we're the station that doesn't play, play rap. rap you know <laughs> right. so now like you know in order to survive you have to have some type of influx of hip hop in your situation so the things that were really driving the culture at that time, you know, like, especially when you talk about, like, mid to late 80s, is like, you know, shit, crack cocaine was on the swing, and the world was changing. You know what I'm saying? A lot of latchkey ch- latch kids, you know, kids who were, like, you know, like, had to fend for themselves and just figure life out. And, you know, and I think, you know, that really, you know, cultivated and bred the music of that era and you know and then like with the culture being so fresh and there's so many aspects in it everybody wanted to figure out how they was going to be a part of it mm-hmm. oh i can't rap but i could draw all right you're a graffiti artist man i can't draw but i could dance now you got the break dances right. and pop lockers oh man i can't do none of that but i know a good song when i hear one boom djs right. you know and then like and then back to the mc so everybody found their part you know and then at, and when the getting was really good hip-hop was employing so many people you know what i'm saying like you know like mm-hmm. whether it be like street teams which i used to be a part of a street team like i was responsible for putting up the poster boards and making sure the records got to the clubs and stuff like that <laughs> and it was great money like you know what I'm saying it got to a point where i was even running my own street team company in dallas because i eventually moved to dallas texas and um and w- was killing it, getting paid, and was paying other people. Like, hip-hop was feeding so many people. Right. So to watch it grow from this seed, you know, on some time-lapse shit, to watch it become this big corporate thing where, like, you know, 
you have like everybody and their mom doing it and they're using rap to sell this, that, and the third. It's just amazing to say that we're alive to see that, you know, because like, you know, we talk about rock and roll and like the pioneers right, of rock and right. roll. We weren't here for that. We don't remember none of that. We're alive in such amazing time where like the architects that helped build this culture in which we are like, you know, which is like a foundation for us, they're still around. Right. Like you could still reach out to Cool Herc and be like, yo, man, thanks, bro. You know, you can reach out to Bambada. Man, thanks for Planet Rock, man. You can still see Karras one. You can still catch Big Daddy Kane, Rock Him, uh, Run DMC, right. at least two thirds of Sugar Hill Gang. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's you know, it's our, our pioneers are still here. Do you think that we uh, show enough appreciation for those pioneers? Not at all, because like. Hip hop is the only um, music form where I really see them really trying to age people out. Right. You know, like, oh man, he's old. He's forty two. Right. He's dead to us. Right. You know, some people transcend that, like you know, the Jay Zs of right. the world, the Nas's. But at the end of the day, just imagine if Jay Z would have retired after the Black album. He actually got bigger hit records after the after his quote unquote retirement. And I think, you know, as it relates to music, you know, I think people born after a certain year only want to hear music to party and turn up to because radio created that condition. That's what I was going to say. You know what I'm saying? Like, radio has done more fucked up shit and damaged hip hop more than anything, anybody else. Because the problem is with a lot of the processes with radio, they do a lot of their research from clubs. And strip clubs. So it, in, in certain cities, it really makes the overall tune or the overall vibe of the music have a certain tone because everybody is trying to compete to make a similar sound. Every now and then, there are guys who break through, like J. Cole. Like J. Cole has done the impossible because he's gotten on the record this year, I mean, the radio this year with like what a lot of people would consider underground hip hop records. You know what I'm saying? Like, these songs aren't your traditional quote-unquote singles, but he has a great machine behind them and such a heavy cult following that connect to what he's saying. He's the anomaly in the situation. Same thing with Kendrick Lamar, but I don't think people fully appreciate Kendrick Lamar commercially as they should because he's had a lot of great records, but radio didn't start fucking with him until he was like, pour up, drink, headshots, drink. It took him making a drinking and getting high song to, for radio to embrace him. And I think that's messed up because he had other songs that weren't about that that actually could help people. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't It's Gonna Be All Right shoved the down our throat thing. the same way um, Watch Out Little Bitch, No Hands. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why wasn't it shoved down our throat the same way those type of records are? Because some things are forced upon us. Right. You know they what I'm saying? Right. And, like, and I think more people, and especially DJs, should program from the heart and fight a little harder and get more creative. I'm just starting to DJ, right? I'm taking like a DJ course at the Scratch Academy, shout the SAE. Um, and <laughs> to creatively mix things that don't sound like everything else, it's tough. But DJs have to work harder to be better to yeah. figure out how to do it. And that's and what they were doing in the beginning. Doing, right? right. That's what they were doing in the beginning. And, I, and we listened to... So what are your thoughts? Because cause I think Dame Dash touched on a lot of this mm -hmm. when he was kind of exposing and, and, and talking, about, talking about culture vultures and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. What do you think about his comments on, on both um, Sway's show as well as on... Uh, uh, Breakfast Club? Breakfast Club. Yeah, I only caught like little like you know snapshots That's of right. it, whatever Instagram offered me in 15-second uh, spoon <laughs> dosages. But uh, the... Um, I mean, there are a lot of culture vultures because at the end of the day, it's a business. Everybody, like, you know, you have some people who, like, I do it for the culture. Like, you know what I'm saying? But you have some people who's like, how much money can I make off of this? Right. And it's not a bad mentality to have. If you want to make your livelihood the hip-hop culture, you're, you're forced to be a culture vulture in order to figure out how to get money from it. So I understand that aspect of it. And they're always going to be both parties you know like mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna have your purists and you're gonna have your vultures it's just the way it is there's more purists i feel than there are vultures but you know the vultures kind of get vilified because they figured out a way to make money off of things i was driving around yesterday and it dawned on me i pay extra to have my trash delivery service pick up my recyclables which they d then turn to a recycling place 
and get money from. <laughs> The motherfucking trash people, the culture vultures, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like him in the system, they baby. in the system. I'm paying you to get money, <laughs> like, 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 so, like, you know, so anytime you can figure out how to pimp the system in that way, size, shape, or form, or fashion, man, you bad, you a bad person, like, you know, like not bad, like mean bad, right, right, but right. like, man, that's that's dope. smart, right? So, so let's take us back. You you on the street team? Yeah, I used to be. Uh, I used how to old were you team. when you on the street team? Oh my god. Um, here's the thing. I can't see me because, like, uh, you know, this is a podcast, but, uh, you know, I got a very wolf-like beard. Just imagine me having this beard when I was 15. <laughs> so <laughs> I had no problem getting into anywhere. Everybody always thought I was older than what I really was. So, like, you know, people just kind of just always fast-tracked me through places. Like, the crazy thing is, like, so when I graduated from high school, Younger than everybody else because my parents were the ultimate hustlers and didn't want to pay for an additional year of uh, daycare and forged the proper paperwork to get me in school a year early. So, like, you know what I'm saying? So I'm graduating high school when I'm, like, 15, 16. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, But anyway, long story short, um, I graduated high school. I took an internship. Um, there was this thing called survey broadcasting, which I thought had something to do with radio, but it didn't. It was actually like, hey, we're going to send you to a record company and you're going to intern there. I went there and I bust my ass every day. I was there before everybody else. I always checked my work was very thorough, handled my mail outs, went above and beyond the call of duty. So they uh, bumped me up in the company like right after my internship was over and uh, made me the radio assistant to the regional uh, director for Motown. Uh, the, the, like in the, for like the Southwest region. So my job was to like do mail outs, call college radio stations and secondary stations, make sure they're getting the records and stuff like that, making flyers. And this is before like Photoshop was like super duper popping. I'm like, like, you know, the people that do the ransom notes, I'm cutting out paper and, you know, <laughs> glue, glue sticking it down and just making the dopest stuff I possibly can with like, you know, no computer damn near and a copy machine. But like, it was enough to like, wow. you know, make the bosses happy. And, um, so my boss at the time, Shannon Henderson, she had a promotion company called Griot that was like bodying everybody in Houston. And now that she was in Dallas, she wanted to like start a company in, uh, in Dallas. So she had me run it for her because she, you know, legally couldn't really do it because she was the regional rep for Motown. So hands off on all that. And like, and me pass it off to this young wolf that's hungry and is going to be in the clubs and be in the streets and go to the colleges and go to the schools. So she gave me her accounts. And just because of like my work with her, she, uh, I started getting accounts of my own. So I was doing work for her and I also was working my own accounts as well. I mean, I was doing promotion for Electra, Entertainment, Def Jam, uh, uh, wow. everything, that everything that Rush was doing, Loud Records at the time, because they had like crazy records. That, you know, like so to be a hip hop enthusiast as I was, and to get all this music for free, and you're always getting in the clubs for free, and like you know, it was like the ultimate drug. But it also burnt me out on clubbing by the time I was 22. You know what I'm saying? I like, believe that. yo, like, yo, you, I could, that. you couldn't get me to go to a club by the time I was 22. I'm like, yo, I'm over it. Because I was doing it since I was 15. Is right. that what you wanted to be? Was that something that you saw yourself doing as kind of being involved in the music and the culture? Yeah, because you, you, yeah, you said something that I caught. In high school, you said when you first went to the what was it, the, the company you started working for, you thought it was radio. Yeah, serving broadcasting. But it wasn't radio. When I took right. your in the internship, I thought it was radio because, like, um, I wanted to be on the radio to find songs to play on the radio. I didn't really want to be a personality. Because I'm like, what would I say? I'm going to curse. I know I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, I didn't want to be on the radio to like be a personality. I just wanted to find the music and drive the culture. You know what I mean? Like, like Funk Flex was doing like in the 90s in New York. Um, but um, And even like working for a record company, I was like, yo, I want to be an A&R. I want to find people. And granted, I'm doing music at the time myself, but I'm like, hey, I want to, you know, I want to rap. I want to put out a few albums, but I want to find talent because there's so many dope people around in like weird ass cities that people ain't up on. Like, man, I went to Colorado and there's like dope rappers in Colorado and you go to St. Louis and there's dope rappers there. Like, I want to find these people and I want to give them a shot, change their lives. But I never became an A&R. Like, uh, like I, as far as I got in the record company business, I was, uh, I got, uh, so, it, so after I was doing like my street promotion thing, it caught the attention of this company called Platinum Distribution, which was based out of Atlanta. And he had all these really weird D and C list artists that like were popping at one point in time, but they had like the live versions of their albums uh, at first and like compilations. So like I took that job because it was like more money than I was making working 
the radio department at Motown, and I was still able to hustle my uh, my street accounts on the side and then pass it down like you know my boss did to me. Like I had my, my homie run the street company while I was working for uh, doing the head like headed up the marketing for my region for uh, Platinum. Um, did that for like a year. They wanted me to move to Atlanta, and I was like, man, I ain't ever going to move to Atlanta. Not for that kind of money, <laughs> but it was mostly like, I'm never going to move to Atlanta. But I ended wow. up moving to Atlanta because yeah. I'm sitting here talking to y'all. But, right. <laughs> 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 but like, they, they was trying to get me to move for like bullshit money, and I'm so glad I didn't come. Like, you know, I swear, like, God pushed, puts flashes of the answer in my head. He told me don't do it, and I didn't, and the company shut down like three, four months like after I said no. Um, but anyway, so... From that, I started working at EMI Distribution. I had my first son, and I didn't have a job, but I had my street team stuff, so I was still making money from that, but I didn't have no job, so it was like grind time. Like, yo, because I've worked from the... Even when I wasn't working, I was shooting dice at school, so I always had money coming in, you know? So, you know... Is that I, how you got your name? Yeah, absolutely, because I used to always walk around with dice in my pocket, and, like, I, they, they, like, I used to snack a rattlesnake, like, you know, like, like when I was right, cause I, cause I always would be moving fast down the hall, like bopping. So like you hear the dice, like, so they started calling me head crack and it just stuck. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and the cool thing about like, when I was like, cause I graduated high school in Dallas and nobody in Dallas knew shit about rolling dice. At least not at my school. Cause I graduated from a school called the Colony High. No one knew shit about dice. I'm making up the rules as I go. Like, yeah, you lost. That's a head crack. <laughs> <laughs> Probably somebody's gonna shoot me, and like you know, once they realize, you know, once they like realize it, all like all the times I got them, but uh, you know, making up the rules as I go, but whatever. But um, so yeah, so I ended up working for EMI Distribution in their mail room, but I killed it so hard in the mail room. They're like, hey man, listen, come on, I want you to do the marketing for us. So wow. they they gave me a marketing gig. How did you kill it in the mail room? Just made sure shit got to where it needed to go. But but they all, but the they also room. but they gave me the mailroom job because they knew my street done. team work and they knew what I was doing for platinum. There just wasn't a position at the time. Gotcha. But they wanted uh, my man Billy Bowles looked out mm-hmm. for me and mm-hmm. wanted me to like you know like hey man I know you need this job because there was one company there was this one lady at Universal. She wouldn't want she didn't hire me because I think she felt I was more qualified than her and I was like a threat. To her gig, man, and that shit was whack. That was the first time I ever really felt oppressed. Well, the first time, you know, like, <laughs> but um, so anyway, so my man Billy gave me the shot at um, at uh, you know, got me the gig at you uh, you know, you, uh, EMI, and uh, started a mail room. Was in the mail room for like I don't know six weeks, two months, and then they got me the marketing gig, and I was just like, I did it like it was the last job I would mm-hmm. ever have, and like mm-hmm. grind hard. And the cool thing is, like, one night I'm at a party with my man Kino. And another dude by the name of Super Cake, you know, it's in the Bodega Brothers with me. And uh, there was a new station that came to town called 97.9 The Beat. And we're at this party, we're drinking, uh, as usual. And um, <laughs> he was like, yo, this is a new station in town, and they're playing De La Soul and Ghostface Killer. And I was like, yo, I want to work there. And Kino was like, yeah, me too. So I was like, yo, let's go to the studio tomorrow and make a tape. So we went to the studio the next day, we made a tape, turned it in. And, uh, and it was like a five-minute Actually, no, it was like a 10-minute window like of what our show sounds like. We didn't have no show. We made it up in the studio that day. But this is what our show sounds like for 10 minutes. We're like, hey, maybe if we're lucky, we can get the 10 to midnight, uh, 10 to 2 in the morning shift, keep our day jobs. So we turn in the tape. We hear, we get a call back um, probably about, about maybe like five days later. Somehow, even though we had everything in one envelope, somehow the CD and the bio and the press kit all got separated. But this lady by the name of Marie Kelly knew me because I used to always go up to the station. She worked at K104 and drop off records, sometimes like freestyle on the spot for them and like, you know, talk some hip hop stuff with them and, and go on my merry way. So she recognized my voice. She's like, yo, that's Ed Crack. I got his number. So she called me. Boom. I'm like, yo, we got, we heard your tape. We want y'all to come in. Da 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 da. So next thing you know, we went in. We met with this guy named Daryl Johnson. Um, he was like a young rogue program director who actually used to program hot in Atlanta, but they sent him to Dallas to start this new station for, uh, for radio one. And, uh, he liked the fact that we ain't never did radio before. And he's like, yo, listen, we want you to be our night show. So me, super can Kino became the night show. And yo, we was catching bodies. Like they you said, super K. Super K, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Super That's crazy. Yeah, like, I mean, they sent some of the biggest names in radio to come to Dallas and kick our ass and we kick their ass. And, and and it was it was it was supposed to not be done. Like they was in there with the mentality, man. If we can at least you know be in the top ten, and I'm like, why would you want to just be in the top ten? Fuck that. 
It's be number one. one. Yeah, top. like you know what I'm saying. Like I, I, you know, I don't understand radio research. You know, at the time I didn't understand radio research, and I didn't care about it. Like, yo, no, let's go and win. Let's do right. stuff that ain't never been done before. Like, I think our finest radio moment as a trio. Um, it was the seven year anniversary of the death of Tupac, and I found some weird, rare Tupac interview that ain't never really made the rounds. He was talking about poetic justice. So what we did is we took the audio. We cut it all up and made it sound like it was like a current interview. And like we teased it. We had drops and shit. Yo, five days into Tupac comes back. So on, oh, this, on, on the actual seventh anniversary of the death of Tupac, and the radio station is in a mall. So what we did is we put curtains up in a studio so you couldn't see inside <laughs> our booth. We ran a three-part Tupac interview back <laughs> that sounded just like he was talking about modern day stuff. Like, and I think at the time, like, you know, like Ja Rule was still kind of popping. And I was like, yo, man, uh, so what you think about Ja Rule, Pac? He ain't me. <laughs> 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 yeah, man, Kino's like, yo, Pac, man, you've been a go you've been going for a long time, man. Like, what were you thinking about the whole time you were gone? Janet Jackson, Janet Jackson, Janet Jackson. It's all poetic <laughs> justice stuff, but it was so it was so cleverly chopped up, weaved and edited. Yo, we got so like people were calling up on the on the phone crying and wanting to talk to him. There were people like we was peeking through the curtains, there was people outside the studio holding like candles up and like, <laughs> and, like just classy, trying to get a glimpse bro. of Pac. And then at at the end of the interview, he's like, and this would have been like if he was still alive. <laughs> People were so <laughs> pissed. Like, hey, but like, it was radio theater at its finest because it was like a seven yes. day long con. And like, you know, like, and we put the production value into it, like, and like, and, and it was believable. And it's about doing things that people remember. My only regrets is a lot of things that we did on the night show. We never really archived it because our whole was like, eh, we'll do a better show tomorrow. Right. You know, like we were slightly arrogant mm -hmm. in that respect to where like we just didn't really care about backing up a lot of the things we, you know, we did because like it's just like, okay. Because, you know, because some people like to go to the well multiple times and rerun and replay their popular things. Because we were a night show, we didn't run best right. of. You know, it's not like right. a morning show. You're just doing your show from day to day. So we didn't really think about that. And, um... You know, and, and so a lot of things we lost. And even, like, the skimmer that would record our things on cassette, it was trained to only cut on when the mics are on. So if we're running something from, like, the, the Vox Pro or the computer, it's not running that. So a lot of our best stuff, which was recorded on a Vox Pro, never made it to tape because it's just, like, you know, because the technology at the time. So it, it makes me so mad because there's so many things that, like, you know, I will often forget about. Like, me and Kino to be talking. He's like, yo, remember that time we did that? Like, oh, yeah. One time we did a thing. We were giving away tickets to a concert, and we had two contestants come down to the station. We didn't tell them what they was going to be doing or what the hell. So it was like, hey. Uh, and, and so, so like, you know, so we come out of a song. It's like, yo, we got blah, blah, blah. Where you from? Blah, blah, blah. Where you from? And then, like, you know, we turn the music down. We start talking to him. We need you to have a seat right over here. Then my man Super K brings out this duct tape and starts duct taping up to a chair. <laughs> like deep, like mummified. <laughs> All right, first person who gets out gets the tickets. All right, coming up next, we got the new song from Nelly. Uh, <laughs> and then, like, so the whole rest of the show, like, was them trying to, trying get, to get, get out, out of the thing. thing. Like, and, like, and once again, because of, like, you know... We didn't we don't we didn't video archive none of this we didn't record that, yeah. it but we really did a, we did a, we tried to do our best job to do the theater of the mind to like so right now well uh, it seems like he got his hands free um, but uh, I don't know if he's gonna be able don't to move the tour so <laughs> but uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll keep at it <laughs> you know like yeah, right, uh, right. coming up next your chance to win <laughs> like like you know we just kept it pushing man so like we used to do just crazy fun stuff like that all the time and it's just like this I I never hear that on radio anymore like you know there's so many things I want to do on a morning show that I just can't because like it's so it's so bogged down by commercials and like you know mm -hmm. gotta play X Y Z amount of songs like you know like. I'm a creative person, and like sometimes it's hard to be box. as creative as you want to be because like you're in a box, like you're sharing a blanket with seven other children. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, uh, when, when, how long did y'all do the night show? I guess we did the night show for like four and a half, five years, and then um, Steve Harvey who was doing the morning show at 97 on the beat at the time. Was left? He left the company. He left Radio right. One because you know sometimes you got to leave the company and come back stronger, and he totally did that. Um, so they needed a morning show. So they put me with Ricky, who I was slightly familiar with 
Because, like, you know, I'm doing night show for, like, five years. Was Ricky in Dallas then, or was he no, still in Birmingham? No, he was still in Birmingham. That's okay. But, like, I was slightly familiar with Ricky because, like, you know, we would have the TV on in the studio, and I think he had a, he had a show on uh, BT called right. uh, yeah. The Way We Live, and he also uh, hosted Comedy, Comedy View. View. So I would always see his face, but didn't really know any of his material, you know, prior to meeting him. So when we meet, it's, like, weird, like, you know, because he's from Birmingham, I'm from New York and shit, like... Hey, which 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 you about? Which you about? Just, yeah, like you know, what I'm saying it was weird. Like yeah. it was like the scene uh, in um in um what was that movie with uh, Robert De Niro and uh, Al Pacino and shit like with uh, Heat, heat okay. <laughs> you know, like the, the the table scene of Heat because like we don't you know we're just both trying to figure each other out. Mm-hmm. So like you know so as the morning show started rolling, they started adding other pieces, other characters, and you know it had eventually built to this thing that you know we uh, we have today. So that started out with somebody else's you know idea of bringing the, the two talents together. Yeah, yeah, you know, and building a morning show. Because, like, it, at the time, it was very popular to be like, hey, you know, have a comedian anchor it because, you know, the comedian's going to be funny and, you know, mix mm-hmm. and put some people around him that, you know, know the music and, you know, the other stuff. And, you know, that was kind of like the formula. Like, you know, there was a lot of shows that were doing it at the time. Like, I know, like, D.L. Hewley had, like, a morning show briefly and, um, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, of course, Steve Harvey's situation, but he surrounded himself with older people. It was weird. But, uh, you know, mm-hmm. but like, you know, but like his situation works for his target demographic, you All know, right. Whereas, you know, so. So you, so y'all formed the group and then that's how the radio show, uh, the morning show started. That's how the morning started. show started, man. 97 out of beat in Dallas, man, in a little tiny studio in the mall, Valley View Mall. And, um. And it, it was dope, you know, like... But were y'all syndicated at the time? No, we, we didn't start syndicated, because, like, you know, you got to prove yourself. Right. You can't just, like, turn a show on and, like, all right, let's put them everywhere. Like, nah, you got to make sure you work in one city first. So once uh, we, you know, proved ourselves in Dallas, they put us on in uh, St. Louis. And then from St. Louis, it was, uh, let's say, Baltimore. Then after Baltimore, it was like Miami. Then after that, it was like an avalanche. Everybody came to the party after that. Yeah, because y'all feel that, feel that gap. Because you said talking about how there's a, a select shows that have a demographic that's older, mm-hmm. and then you guys come in and fill that gap for us because you know it's a it's a younger show. It's it's more stuff that's relative to what we're talking about and our thirty year old peer group and stuff like yeah. that. So definitely bridge that gap. Yeah, it, but, it's but, a battle. It, it, it is a battle, and I wanted to talk about that with the landscape. So when you guys first joined, y'all kind of feel that void for that younger generation, that target audience, I'm assuming being, what, about 25 to to 40 or even younger than it that? It depends the conversation. Like, sometimes they tell you, hey, you're speaking to, mm-hmm. you know, people that are 18 to 34. Uh, then it switches to, you're speaking to women. You speak, you're specifically speaking to women who are ages, you know, 23 to 38. And then it changes to, you got to speak to the kids, bro. Like, you know, it like radio will drive you crazy. That's why, like, I look at people in their face and I just nod. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, because mm-hmm. whatever it is you're telling me is going to change in a couple weeks. All I can do is do me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I'm not going to let you drive me crazy. That's, that sounds about like the typical workplace. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you know, like, yo, radio is just like everybody else's job. Like, you know, there's there's somebody working at Wendy's right now who's a vegetarian and fucking hates beef. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, but the- <laughs> I work at a radio station. I hate half the shit they play on the radio. But at the end of the day, I'm... I'm there to put you onto shit that I'm interested in. Right. You know, too. Right. Like, you know, I'm going to tell you about the artists you like. But I'm also going to, like, you know, I'm going to sneak some stuff in there. I'm going to tell you about Earth Gang. Earth Gang. Right? I was going to tell you. I'm, I'm going to tell you about. You put me on Earth Gang. Thank I was you, coming man. from, I was riding from Atlanta. You said, check out Earth Gang. And they ride. It's heavy. Word, right, man. It's heavy. It's jamming. There, there's so many dope people who have nobody in their corner fighting for them. You know, like, and at the end of the day, the culture will only exist if you're pushing the envelope and just pushing people even if you look at like you know sales trends the people that get played on a radio a lot aren't even the people selling records right. they, there's something to be said about that there is a reason why rick ross doesn't have an album that sold two million copies with that being said i also feel like they don't play his best music mm-hmm. they play his ratchet shit mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying they don't play mm-hmm. his stuff that could actually maybe mm-hmm. speak to somebody who's going through something you know um you know, and even people like Young Jeezy who figure out a way to keep it street, but also at the same time kind of like inform people, I feel like more so in his career at this point, they should be supporting him more than ever. Oh, yeah. Same thing with T.I. Yeah. The fans won't let T.I. grow up. Right. Yeah, T.I.'s still in the trap. Whatever. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it don't, it don't really I'd be so up. disappointed if I saw Ti in a trap right now. You know what I'm saying? It's like, really you have all these businesses and all this money, and you have a show on TV. Like, no, show people what happens when you leave the trap and go legit. But the fans don't want to let cats like that do that, and it's just so disappointing. And that's just another thing about hip hop culture that we have to figure out a way to to reset the mind state. Like, hey, don't age these people out. Let them still entertain you. Like, have you you guys ever seen Big Daddy Kane live? Mm-hmm. Like in the last five, ten years. Mm-hmm. Like Big Daddy Kane year. has one of the best, best show, live show. rap shows you will ever see in your life. There are, I probably say 80% of people who are 18 years old don't know who Big Daddy Kane is. And it's unfortunate. It. Like people who listen to pop music have at least heard of the Rolling Stones. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. They have at least heard of an Eric Clapton. Right. They at least heard at least one Beatles song. The Beatles. Right. Hip hop radio. Does so such a great job of like crumbling artists up and, throw, and throwing them right. away. But it's dope that they have like this new boom format and this new throwback format, like in a lot of markets where they're playing like retro artists. But if they let the wrong people curate it, it's It'll gonna eventually only show you the worst things about that culture. Because like when you look back at, let's go with two thousand three to two thousand ten. If I pulled out a pistol right now and I said, tell me 10 classic records from that period, you're going to stutter and you're going to say, oh, mm-hmm. lie. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Remove out, you know, once you remove Outkast from the conversation right. and, like, you know, a couple Jay-Z records, like, there was just a lot of, like, disposable music. A lot of records that have been on the radio in the last, like, five or ten years, right. them joints haven't aged well. Right. Soldier Boy is a great guy, personally. Right. But- His songs have not aged well. Like, I put on, uh, you know, we played a throwback joint in the morning, and one day I put on, uh, it was either Turn My Swag on a Pretty Boy Swag, and it was just like, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, right, right, right. Like, right. I wasn't really a fan of it then because, like, because I, I like lyrics and I like things that are gonna, I don't know, make me think, but like, I didn't like it then, but even now it's just like, uh, uh right, yeah, right, but right, like, right. but on the flip side of that, Soldier Boy's a cool dude, mm-hmm. cool, and like, and to see somebody so young figure the game out. Get a lot of money, money off of it, right? You know whether or not you like what the he music, contributed to yeah. the culture at all, but like there's something to be said about the yeah, business act of it. Us. Yeah. When we talked about the target audience, I, I wanted to make a point. I'll get to a point. So when you guys jumped into radio, the Ricky Smiley Morning Show, y'all y'all were the new young group, young uh, targeting the young audience, um, eighteen thirty four, whatever. But now you have this new giant that's come in. And I'm talking about the Breakfast Club and just trying to look at how they've come in and kind of shaken things up a little bit. How do you view the competition between your show and, and that show? Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's like the equivalent of having Showtime and HBO. You know, some people like one, some people like the other. And it's totally okay to like both. You know what I'm saying? Like, Charlamagne the God is a cool dude. Like, you know, that's, that's my man. You know what I'm saying? And, and I've been a fan of his for years. Like, even, you know, even going back to, like, the Wendy days. And, like, the weird thing about radio is, like, people think just because you're on rival situations that there's always beef and tension. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just, you know, in a complete moment of transparency, I was so relieved to know that, you know, Charlemagne appreciated me, too. Right. You know what I'm saying? It just, helps. just on some, it, on some it, black, it helps. Some it black helps. man to black man it shit. Helps. You know what I'm saying? Because, like... You know, I ain't never did no sucker shit a day in my life. You know what I'm saying? Or or harbored no ill will towards anybody or, like, mm-hmm. felt jealous of other people's situations. So, like, you know, I have no problem just sitting back and just admiring what certain people are doing. Because, like, even when they started popping, you know, I was telling anybody who would listen, hey, listen, we probably need to do a better job with our online content. Because right, right. blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, because, like, you know, because perception is reality. In, in in radio, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you see certain things a lot, you're going to, like, you know, believe that this is the only voice in that situation. So that's why, like, over the last few months, I really took it upon myself to pay a guy out of my pocket to come to the studio and videotape the interviews that I do, or even we do as a morning show sometimes, and post them online. Because if you don't see them, they didn't happen, and you didn't do it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and it, and I've been telling people about this for years. Like, yo, like, hey, we got blah, blah, blah coming in. You sure you don't want to tape that? I'm going to tape that. You know what I'm saying? And, like, I got tired of being the I told you so guy. You know right. what I mean? So, right. you know, it is what it is. So now in that department, virally, 
we're chasing the chuck wagon. Right. Even though if you look statistically, we've probably like, you know, had way more content that we could have put on the on the web. We didn't. So now that's that's the fight that we have mm-hmm. to have and that's a fight that I plan on at least throwing punches in. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, Uh even if it's out of my own pocket and it has nothing to do with the situation I'm on and it's about my brand personally, because, like, at the end of the day, I do a lot of the interviews. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I will go home and come back to work to interview somebody because I am that passionate about About the culture. culture. I'm that passionate about what I do. And a lot of time, it's a lot easier to conduct an interview and get what you want when it's just you one-on-one anyway. Mm -hmm. Because, like, you know, like, interviewing people is, like, it's like going to a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. No one's going to sit on your psychiatrist's couch and tell you everything you want to know in the first five minutes of an interview. You got to get them comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Make them make them relax. Mm-hmm. Once that spine curve and go into a C motion, you got them. They'll tell, <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you anything. Lock you know what I'm saying? Lock we, we did a great interview with R. Kelly um, a couple years ago. And if that interview was done live on the radio, it wouldn't have been as great because, like, you know, you only talk for a couple minutes. All right, we got to hear a play a song. Oh, we got to have a good commercial break. Mm-hmm. But when you get to come to work after Just the fact, right. sit down, unrushed, you got 30 to 45 minutes to really flesh it out and get the details, that's the best way to do an interview, man. Like, you know, the, the, and, and I'm always fighting for those things. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're going to take this person live? Uh, uh, we probably shouldn't, you know what I'm saying? Right, but right, like, right. sometimes they listen to the kids, sometimes they don't. And that's the suckiest part about sometimes being the youngest person in the room. Like, ah, shut up. You're still fairly new on <laughs> radio. But it's like, but, right. I study this shit. <laughs> was that the, what, was that R. Kelly, the, the best interview that you said oh, you've no. had? Nah, Who would you nah, say nah, it was? You're probably best. your best. It's, it's hard to say the your best. Top like, I mean, three or something like that. Um, I always enjoy interviewing, I always enjoy interviewing Rick Ross. Mm. Because I feel like I have the ability to sometimes to get things out of him that he doesn't give to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some things are online, some things aren't. But, like, I feel like the Rick Ross interviews are good. From that situation with him, I'm, I want you to continue. But mm-hmm. speaking about Rick Ross, um, him and, and, with, and with, his, uh, with his girl, Lyra. Yeah, Lyra. What do you, you, think, you think, just from your observations... You think him and like he's really fit into into Lear and and he was really crushed by whatever happened. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we did an interview with him probably about probably about a month and a half ago, two months ago, right. and this is when he you know really started you know when the ring was shown mm-hmm. and all that other good stuff. And I ain't never seen him smile so much or be so happy. Like he was genuinely gen- genuinely in love with that girl and hella smitten. You know, <laughs> over over the situation. She's like, hey, come over here, baby. Tell them, you know, da 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 da. Like, you ain't never seen Rick Ross so unguarded. So, you know, like, that instantly made you happy for him. And it was dope because, like, he's never given me that. Right. So that's great. So, okay, you're telling us this. We even got them to sing Belba DeVoe's Poison together <laughs> on video. Oh, yeah. Who does that? Yeah. He, you know what he, I'm saying? He, he was so, all the way in on that Yeah, ones. man. So, like, I be trying to just get, like, unique moments with people, and it's always great when people feel comfortable enough with you to where you, they know you ain't trying to set them up with a loaded question because I'm not really here to make you look bad. I'm here to have a conversation and try to get you to talk about the things that people may expect you to talk about. I mean, I think a, a great case was um, with CeeLo. Um, you know, obviously the... Easiest places to go with CeeLo. So, that rape case. You know, but... It, it's, such a te- it's, a, it's such a touchy thing. And the cool thing was... He kind of... Gla- he kind of grazed across it and referred to it as the incident. Right. That is such a tough thing and such a, a hot-button buzzword with people that... It's unfortunate that he may never actually be back into the good graces with some people because of what happened but he's talented and he's very sorry mm-hmm. he's a talented dude he put out an album called heart blanche that i don't think anyone really even really 100 percent understands that is out or even heard it and it's just so unfortunate because like he's truly sorry mm-hmm. and like you could see you could tell in my eyes when he's sorry mm-hmm. he's sorry mm-hmm. and he's trying to do whatever he can to like you know get back in people good graces and we mess up Right, you know what right, I'm saying? Right, right. Not saying what he did was right. You shouldn't really be drugging people's drinks. But he knows that right. now. 
Like, you know, sometimes people need to have that hand pop moment because, like, that doesn't take away from the fact that even at the height of his fame, when he didn't have to do it, went back and did an album with Goody Mob right, after they did an album dissing him. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then created a situation for Goody situation. Mob to be on TV, TV on right. CBS. He didn't have to do that because mm-hmm. he was here mm-hmm. and he came down from the mountain to help his buddies out like you should. I feel like some of those other things trump the other thing. Yeah. You know, so, mm-hmm. you know, I, I wish him the best of luck, man. He, he, and he gave us a really good interview. Who were your other two interviews? Um, you, you mentioned Ross. I, I interrupted yeah, yeah, you. Ross, I mean, Ross was great. Um, I like... Uh, De La Soul, I did a really good interview with oh, De La man, Soul. I know that was that was amazing for you. It was crazy because like they were, you know, like you grew up watching these right. guys, like and like to see. Were you a fan at that point? Yeah, point. like you know, like <laughs> I, I felt like little little Jimmy Olsen at the Daily Planet, like you know what I'm saying, like you know, asking questions to Superman. Like it, it was just great, man, and like to be able to create an opportunity to also not only just interview them for my personal purposes, but to also get them on TV because I wanted to get them on Dish Nation. And the way I angled and pitched, pitched it, I was able to get them on Dish Nation. So as a fan and also an advocate and a supporter, that felt good to me. Right. You know what I'm saying? It felt so good to me. Like there was a situation one time where, you know, you think everybody in rap knows each other, but you come to find out that they don't. Like Prince Marky D from the Fat Boys, uh, great dude. Lives in Miami now. Does radio. Um, we were at this show, and Ice Cube was there. For some reason or another, Prince Marky D has never met Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> so, me and Cube are kind of cool. So I'm like, you know what? Shit, let's make it happen. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I got I got to introduce right. Prince Marky D to Ice Cube, and it's like, how the fuck did y'all not meet? You know what I'm saying? But, and it was just cool to do that to and just do it, fall right? the fuck back and, like, you know, like, the, the Allstate guy and just, like, <laughs> just admire the situation from afar. Like, you know, like, man, that's what we're supposed to be here to do. Like, enable and help and enhance the situation and make connections that ain't been done before. Because, like, you know, hopefully whenever he thinks of, whenever Prince Monkey thinks of me, maybe he'll think about the time. Like, oh, man, you're cracking. You're a good dude. He introduced me to Ice Cube. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I, man, that, that, sh- that felt cool that to me. Bad. You know, like, you know, I'm not in it for, like, selfish reasons. Some people, like, try to make everything all about them. Like, you know, like, I just, man, shit, uh, heal the people. What you think about a few more questions? I know we got to wrap up, but uh, just some current event. What you think about the beef between Drake and Meek Mills? Yo, the beef between Drake and Meek Mills is interesting because if you... Well, not the... Is, is, what is really a beef? Well, I guess it was yeah, a beef. It's definitely huh? a beef. beef. Okay. Because if you, you would have had the same beef in the 90s or even the early 2000s, Meek Mill would have came on top. And I think Meek Mill went into it with the 90s and early 2000s mentality, as you should. Because if I was to, like, do a PowerPoint presentation with all my notes, right? And I'm Meek Mill here, right? Drake has ghostwriters. Drake has been peed on. I have the girl you want. I'm having sex with her. Um, (laughs) And you're Canadian. And, like... He had a lot of stuff to work on. I think this is enough to win if I'm Meek Mill. Right. Right. Drake used social media and, 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 and music in a way to defeat an opponent. I don't think anyone's ever seen that done before. In, in, in a hip hop battle, like this wasn't ether where it was just about lyrics and lyrics, disrespect. Lyrics. disrespect. Mm. This actually, like, it spilled into the streets and actually, like, you know, it was like Drake slapped him and not even with the front hand, but with the back and a little <laughs> bit of knuckle, and the and the internet finished him off. It was the internet. internet that, that did. It was the internet that beat Meek Mill. Right. Drake didn't really beat Meek Mill, but the internet the did. Name did. Yeah, because like if you would have just if you would have just went record for record, because truthfully, his little record where he was like rapping over the Undertaker intro, right, right, right. it wasn't the worst shit ever. But, but the, the internet, once the internet has made their decision, Black Twitter, Black Twitter, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> It's over. Once they've picked their side, it is over, and there's no coming back from that. I think that is historically the first time a light-skinned dude has sunned a dark-skinned dude in <laughs> such a way. Like, the, the panda. The panda, the, 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 the panda man left his, left his marks in him, man. Like, the last time you've seen light-skinned versus dark-skinned oppression in such a fashion, it was LL versus Mo D, but there was no social media. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, it was it, never seen anything like it, ever. 
But at the end of the day, I think quietly Meek Mill is the winner because at the end of the day, Drake wants Nicki Minaj. And you know this. And at the end of the day, that's, that's Meek's girl. That's Meek's. So uh, another question. What, what's the current state of hip hop today? Current state of hip hop is it's, it's all over the place. And uh, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about how we have devalued the music to such a point to where expand, uh, fans expect everything for free. Like, look at the numbers Adele just did with a new album, 3.4 million copies. You want to know what Adele's not doing? She's not making a mixtape for free. Mm. Neither is Justin Timberlake. Neither is, uh, you know, any other self-respecting pop artist who is trying to move units because they value their art, they value their music. We have conditioned our fans to expect it for free. And then when you factor the legal free, which is like streaming, you know, mixtapes, like Future, God bless him. Work ethic is incredible. He's given away like four albums in one year. You know? Albums, forget mixtapes. Like, yeah, albums. these ain't mixtapes. These are albums. He's giving them away. And this, this creates a condition amongst consumers. Oh, I don't got to buy your music. You're going to give it to me for free. And if you're not going to give it to me for free, I'm going to listen to it on Spotify. I'm going to stream it. So you can make, I don't know, four cents for every time I listen to your album. You know what I'm saying? Like, right, right. it's hard for artists to make money with this particular uh, business model in play. And that's why you have, you know, the the um, the vicious cycle of labels wanting to do the 360 deals and get all the money from the artists from, like, their shows and merchandising because the labels are suffering a lot as well. And then, you know, artists are forced to have to figure out other things to supplement the loss of income. You actually have rappers selling drugs now. Like they're actually like rappers doing who, it. That who take a little money and they 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 low key flood in the street with work because it's not like it was, you know, back in the day, you know, like and and, it, and it's so unfortunate because like that does not happen on the pop side. What's the solution? For, but what's the solution for, for for the rappers and and to get them lucrative deals and to get them to to, to value the music? What's what, what's your thoughts on that? I, I don't think the, the change in the, uh, in the answer is easy, but I think the current wave, and, like, and you're starting to see it slowly happen, but like, I called this shit like 10 years ago. I was telling Kino, I was like, yo, listen, what's going to happen in the future, albums are going to be sponsored and given away with another tangible item. Because like, music isn't as necessary as it was before because it's so disposable because you can get it anywhere. Mm-hmm. So what you're going to see in the future, the same way you saw like Jay-Z's Magna Carta album, uh, you know, Paired up with the Samsung with the, situation, yeah, with the, you know, uh, you know, Drake's next album might be brought to you by Pantene. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> and, and, and giving away with, you know, like some milk, yeah, something, something else. else. And, but like, you know, but they have the exclusive rights. I think that's the total. Um, I think as it relates to hip hop, I think that's no the next. It's going to be the next business model because like it's hard to condition people to pay again when they've been getting things for free. It, it, you can't undo that. Back. Right. You know, if you thought people buying bootlegs was bad, you know, and that was just a small percentage of people going buying bootleg cassettes. Well, not really small. I mean, but like, mm-hmm. it's not like the simplicity of of me being able to pull out my phone right now and listen to the album that just came out yesterday for free because I'm paying nine ninety nine a month for Spotify, iMusic, or Tidal. You know, because like, if I if I'm paying my nine ninety nine a month, and I can listen to everything I want for free. Why should I buy your album unless I really rock with you like that? I have connects with all these labels and I can get every album for free, but I actually buy shit because I'm such a fan. I bought Red Man, I bought Logic, I bought Young Jeezy, I bought, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I could totally call my man from Def Jam and get it, but like, you have to, you have to support the culture to keep it going, you know? I mean, I guess that's perfect segue, Bodega Brothers. Yes, sir. Let's talk a little bit about that, the dynamic, how you guys came together, because it's, it's really a unique story. It is. Um, it's crazy because, like, you know, when I moved to Texas and was, like, finishing high school, I used to always hear about this Mexican kid who people said, yo, you remind me of this Mexican kid from Louisville High. And, like, Kino used to always hear about the same thing about me. Like, yo, you remind me of this black kid that goes to the colony. And then when we finally met, it was like, it's you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like we knew who each other was before we even met each other. He was in a group called Technology, which was a part of a bigger group, which me and my group at the time were having beef with called Squad X. But it wasn't like real beef. Like, 
it was like it was like a secret war like you know how like you know like USA and Putin mm-hmm. they, they be, you know it's like there's tension but no one's no, no one's, one yeah no one's like in the first shot but there's definitely tension and like there was snipes and barbs and you know people were waiting but anyway so keynote was in that crew and then you got Travi the Irishman uh, he was in another group called the Menu and uh, and like and everybody had like great stage shows so. Um, when I stopped doing as much group stuff as I was with the group I was with at the time, I started doing solo records and, uh, I had a hype guy who me and him just kind of like, you know, just, just associated for whatever reason. And Travi, who was just leaving his group was like, yo, I'll back you up on stage. Just like, yo, just bring me with you. And I was like, word, then, you know, travel, Travi is such a loyal dude. So me and Travi, we traveling, we doing shows all across the country, you know, and then an opportunity came for us to go to Europe to do some, do some shows. And, um... Me, Travi and Keynote had a couple songs that we recorded that were a part of my set now when I was doing solo stuff. So I was like, well, damn, I want y'all to come to Europe, but I don't want y'all to just come and do one song. Right. Tell you what, let's make a couple, a couple extra songs, just like, you know, just to fill up the 45 minutes to an hour that we'll be rocking and like, you know, really fluff it out. But because we were so tight, you know, because me and Kino are doing a night show every day. So, like, you know, like, at this point, we're, like, fucking best friends. And, like, you know, and Travi, you know, we've always seen each other and hanging out. The songs wrote themselves. Because, like, we were just writing records about just, like, real things that would happen. We would hang out and just, like, just, like, just B-boy shit. So, like, 12 songs materialized quickly. So, like, you know, me and Kino were in the gym one day. He's like, yo, we got to call our crew something. Like, and then we, like, yeah, I got Bodega Brothers. Yeah, you know, what does that mean? Well, like, you know, like, Bodega is like, you know, you can get anything from a Bodega. Like, you know, you can buy, like, a sandwich, cigarettes, rolling papers, weed at some quality Bodega. It's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Bodega is all for everything. And I felt like musically, that's what our group is doing. We're giving you a little bit of everything because, like, we, we're the same, but we don't agree on everything. You know, we don't agree on everything. Like, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. like, man, me and Trav, I be having, like, and Keto be having such heated, like, Arguments about politics and like gun laws and like you know but like because Kino and Trav I feel like yeah everybody should have a gun why why West like <laughs> like no like everyone's gonna no. get shot like you know like, like but and like so like but it's you know but everybody has a valid point for where they're coming from but we can like clash fight argue about shit and go do an amazing show and high five each other and, and go our separate ways and come back and do it again and, it, and it's just such a great situation because like imagine getting to travel with your with your best friends like and it's what you do. You right, know, and right, like, right. and like, and your job is to just figure out ways to do creative things. Like, we're opening for Rick Ross uh, at the end of the month. Oh wow! Oh, wow. And, and the thing that we're doing, where at? Where at? In Dallas. In Dallas. It's this place called the Bomb Factory. Mm-hmm. And the thing that we're doing for this Rick Ross show is so fucking absurd and so not been done before. Like, oh my god! Like, you know, and, but that's the thing. We're always trying to push our limits and, and, and test ourselves. Like, we did a show a couple weeks ago. We opened for the Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan, mm-hmm. which is kind of ill because it's such a weird extreme. Like, why Wu-Tang Clan? Rick Ross. Like, our music covers such a wide season. spectrum of things. Like, It's more than just one one genre or one type of style or what have well, you. I think the lines are becoming blurred. There was, like, a period in time yeah. where, like, you wouldn't see certain groups on a bill with certain other artists. Right. But, like, now I think the lines are becoming blurred again where, like, you know, hip-hop is such, such a fragile point. People are coming to support a little bit of everything all in the same night. I was hosting an event last night at the Omen Cypher, and there was, like, a little bit of everything. And, like, everybody kind of appreciated it, everything all equally. But, like, yo, like, I mean, but even with the Jizza show, the stuff that we did that night was just so ill and unique to the crowd. Like, when we stepped off the stage, it was like, yo, listen, how would you guys like to do this other show? And I'm like, hell yeah, we'll do it. So How you, oh, how you feel when you get off compared to radio? Because uh, my last question is going to kind of be a, a what's next question for right. you. But how do you feel when you get off the stage performing after an event like that? Um, it, it's, it's, it's my drug. It's your drug. Like, you know, like I, I've never done uh, anything outside of weed before. Uh, but I would imagine it would be the equivalent of a cocaine high, you know, like just, just the adrenaline and the uh, and the dopamine that's flowing through your system from like words that you wrote, mm-hmm. you know, that it connects with people in such a way. And it's weird because the songs that we do live are, you know, different than songs that you may actually hear on our album, which some of them are going to be on the album and some of them have been on previous projects. But like, you know, it's a different approach to the show thing. Because, like, you, every every album cut ain't a show song. Right. So we really have fun up there, and it's almost like a mixture of, 
it's almost like a mixture of stand up and hip hop, but it flows together and it has a groove to it. So like just to see people react to it, man, it, it just gives me the biggest rush. Like I, oh, I am I am more happier doing that than I am anything I do because it's just like, you know, it's all about your creative. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, in radio you gotta color in the lines and, you know, figure things out. But when you're on stage, it's like it's the most liberating thing in the world. And it's like, hey, those people didn't know who we were before. Now they do. <laughs> and then it's starting to turn into, wow, these people came because of us? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the phase that we're at in our career mm -hmm. now where it's like the, we're seeing the, the, the tide shift. And it's scary because, like, it used to be like, man, I hope there's people there. So, like, whoa, really? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then every now and then you'll see people mouth the words to something. And it's like, oh, shit, it's happening. And, and it, it's, it's so dope to be at that point mm -hmm. because, like, you know, we fought so hard to get to it. Yeah, and then you know, for it to be authentic, like you didn't have to sell your soul or anything to get to that point. You yeah, like we, sincerely coming from the from the depths of your soul, bro. We are out there doing exactly what we want to do and saying exactly what we want to say. Mm -hmm. And like, and I, and I can feel like twenty years from now, when I look back on it, I'll be proud of it all. Yeah, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who can't say that. Right. You know, like you know, like imagine uh, Travis Porter. <laughs> doing uh, any of their songs. <laughs> no, <laughs> no hands. Who, no hands. <laughs> when they're 45. Right? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if you'll be able to stand by all of it. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's no shots towards anybody because they're making music for their city for the effect that they want to, you know, to get, you know, the, you know get chicks to twerk to it. And I get it. But, like, you know, like, I, I feel like what we're cooking up is, is different. And, and that's our contribution. Because, like, I mean, hip-hop can't just be all to the left or all to the right. You need everything. Because if everything was all lyrical and conceptual, you get bored of that. Man, I want to party. I want something I can twerk to. Man, they don't play enough twerk music. And that's bizarre world. You know what I'm saying? Right, but, right. you know, like, so it, it's good, man. So, we, we, you know, we just add our little, our little spices to the recipe, man. And just hopefully uh, when you actually see the Bodega Brothers album, LGA drop, uh, fourth quarter, that's what our label is telling us. Um, hopefully it does all those things that I told you it was going to do at the beginning of the podcast. And we're going to follow that pretty much immediately with my solo album uh, called The Rainmaker, which uh, I think is going to really... It's really, it's, it's really going to impress a lot. I, I, I think it's really going to... That is very bold. I, I'm not going to say impress a lot of people, but I think people will learn more about me from that album than you probably ever have from radio or anything else I've done because it's all true stories. And it was, and it's like... And, that, and The Rainmaker is like a snapshot of like a moment in my life where, like, everything was fucked up. Mm. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, like, you know, my grandmother just died. Mm. Niggas dragged me out of my house that I just bought and moved me to a city I didn't want to move to. You know, because it was, it was, everything was all shock. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, Atlanta showed me a lot of love, but, like, it was just all shock. You know what I'm saying? So the Rainmaker is such a reflection of where I was mentally at that time in my life because it was just, like, it was bad timing. Like, you know, you buy a house and people drag you out of it. Like, you know, <laughs> and then your grandmother just dies. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, just out of same. nowhere. Right. And then, like, you know, and, and you know, and you're going through things in your relationship. And, you know, you're trying to be a good parent. And, but you still like to party and have fun. And, uh, and, then, and then people are taking you to California and they're giving you edibles. And, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, 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 so it is, it is, a, it is a, 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 a bubble of all those things and, 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 and a lot of great stories. Get so yeah. hopefully that, you know, resonates with people as well. You, so and, and you mentioned it just now, but... Uh, one one question from a listener, and I think I kind of want to close the the podcast with this question, but but essentially along the lines of what's next, you know, he even mentioned this listener who actually listens every day uh, to the morning show that he would he would be surprised if you stay with the morning show if you continue to do be a personality, I guess, in radio. Um, what's next for you as far as what you would foresee yourself if? Five, ten years from now? Um, my game plan in the next five, ten years, if not have my own morning show or radio show of some sort, because I, I do like doing morning radio, but I don't like how it changed you to a you know particular place. Mm -hmm. Because, like, you know, the, I get so many offers to do things that I, the, and I find myself having to weigh the money. It's like, uh, you know, because when I take off one job, I'm taking off from two. Right. You know, because of radio and Dish Nation, so it's like... <sighs> You know, and the crazy thing is, like, you guys know, like, you know, you get a raise at work, your living expenses change. So it's hard to, you know, you know, like, make any less than what you're making, no matter how much you're making. So, like, you know, so you're always, like, balancing it out. But, like, you know, like, 
I, I, if I if I stayed in radio, it would have to be under, I, I guess, like uh, different terms per se. Um, you know, you know, uh, no slight at the current situation. Excuse me, the, the current situation I'm in, but like you know, just you know, change I, is always step. good. I look at, I, yeah, the next the next step. I, I'm 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 a radio uh, uh, ESPN radio head, so I watch. I look at Colin for example. I don't know if you know Colin Cowherd. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I he heard was with he was with ESPN for ten years. Now he's at Fox doing because he basically said that he he sees more of a terrestrial radio kind of slowly diminishing. Oh, totally, and seeing, yeah. And, and seeing podcasts and on demand type style and and even more what 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 the Breakfast Club is doing with YouTube and and with TV with his now he's with Fox Sports One. Mm-hmm. So just the whole game changed. So I can see, like I said, he was there for ten years. Now he's over here for since September. And he's changing the game that way. So yeah, I mean, and I think and I think there's a lot of truth to that because, like, I mean, like, podcasts. I feel like are kind of the future because it's more of like you set your own personal appointment, right? You know, like I can listen to this particular podcast when I want, whenever I want, however many times I want, as opposed to like on radio. If you miss that moment, you miss that moment. I can't rewind my radio in my car, and that's unfortunate. Like you know, radio in that format is so little disposable. I mean, like, people are making radio apps and stuff like that. Right. But, like, I just feel... And when I say, like, I don't want to do radio in this current form, that that's exactly what I mean. Like, you know, I you know, like, same thing when I left the record industry. Like, you know, from a marketing side, like, I kind of see the, the smoke all around. Like, you know, there's a reason why there's, like, four morning shows in the country. You know, like, right. the money ain't there no more. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? So, like, they, they're syndicating everything. And, um, you know, and the, and the bottom is starting to slowly fall out because you had a lot of people who didn't see the rise of the Internet, the rise of streaming, the rise of podcasts. You got a lot of people who would think they're so fucking smart with their research. And I went to school and I studied this shit. But, like, motherfucker, like Kanye said, listen to the kids, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, listen to the kids. yo. The the person who is fourteen is going to be your target money spending demo in the next few years. You have to cater to these people because your your core demo right now they're going to age out and they're not going to be spending that money anymore. So you have to you got to super serve the youth. Then you know you got to do it. So with that being said, next five years, um, some form of radio you'll hear my voice, see my face. Um, me and my man Kino got a couple of TV shows that we've actually developed that are currently being shopped mm-hmm. um, to uh, different networks and that like multiple production companies are interested in. So that's sexy. And like, and the cool thing is like, we didn't even tell them all our good ideas. Like, <laughs> we just showed you the shaft, right? right. And, like, you right. know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like, we didn't even show you everything. But right. okay, cool. cool. So like, once we get this on the air, then we're gonna hit you back with the next thing. Gotcha. And then as far as music, hopefully we can, um, you know financially sustain ourselves doing those other things to where like when we do make music it continues to have a purpose and we're not making music and, for I, money, and, for and, the I, money. and I think even if we made like two dollars between the two of us doing TV we would still make the type of music that we make now because it's just who we are right. because like we've never made music to make money even though we want to make a lot of money, <laughs> gotta, gotta put that in. There. As, he, as, he yeah. lean, as he leans into the mic on oh, that, oh, I lean in like the most interesting man. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> like, to say that. The freestyle here, correct? Yes, sir. You, you you are known for rapping on the spot on the on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, give us one. No. <laughs> hey, Nick. But, Nick, we need a beat. <laughs> yo, man, y'all got a beatbox. I got you. How did, how, how long did it take you to, I, I guess you would say perfect the craft. Is it is perfection or something um, that you can do with freestyle? You know, like freestyling is like karate. If you, um, you know, if once you learn it, the muscle memory is always there, but every yeah. now and then you get rusty because if you don't do it, all, you know, you don't do it a lot. You know, cobwebs is on the brain, but right. if you do it a lot, right. I think you eventually get good at it. I was always I was always rapping so much and I'm the same way with radio like you know the the cool the great thing the brilliant thing about comedians comedians are really good for retaining their jokes and mm-hmm. doing what they call callbacks and you know and reciting things over and over again mm-hmm. My retarded brain, and which goes back to what I was saying, you know, about like with the night show, eh, I'll do a better joke tomorrow. Like, right. you know, like I don't repeat material. So like if I say something funny on the radio, you're never going to hear it again. I'm not going to say it mm. again because my brain just doesn't work like that. 
You know what I'm saying? Hence why I'm not a comedian. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I may be a guy who some people find funny, but I'm not a comedian. Right, I, right, I, don't have right. a, I don't have a five-minute set or a ten-minute set I can go do somewhere. I'll, I'll make an observation. I'll say what I say. If you laugh, you laugh. It is what it is. But um, but with that being said, like, same thing with the raps. Like, people would be in ciphers rhyming, and if I kick a rap that I wrote, you've heard it. So I don't want to repeat that rap. Just in case you heard it before. So that's really where the freestyle came in handy. You know, like, you know, just not wanting to repeat and always living and giving people something for the moment, you know? Hey, crap. Appreciate sure. you coming out. It's early Saturday morning. Yo, no doubt. In Atlanta, you just got out the club. Yo, if I could paint the ultimate picture, I got out of the club at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, talked to people to about 2.48 in the morning. Then I went home and I played Fallout 4 to about <laughs> 5 a.m. <laughs> Only to be woken up. About my uh, my second youngest child, uh, and uh, yeah, but I'm here for it, man. I man, love. I it. really appreciate. I love it. what you really guys. I love what you guys it. do, man. And I appreciate, appreciate the culture. It. I'm glad we was able to get the get oh, the schedule oh, synced up and make definitely, it happen. Definitely, I, I told BG, I say, man, I, I really want to get this guy on, but I don't know if we're gonna be able to make it work. But but you definitely was a man of your word, and you said, hey, let's make it happen. Hey, man, and, your word is you all got you got. Up, that's all you got, and you got up. So I really appreciate it, man. And like I said, hey, crap, what we trying to do is just. Just capture these moments and no use, uh, use use platform as our platform to capture these moments, uh, to build what we're labeling as a digital library. And you just you just joined that. You just created your book in our library. I'm in the archive. You're in the archive. archive. We got it. Put archive. me in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> we so, got it so, so we on our way to that to that New York uh, public library status digitally. No so, doubt. Uh, but thank you for coming out. Thanks uh, for having me. But let the people know how they can, uh, if they're interested in getting your, your music or learning more about you, how they can uh, reach out to you. Well, here's what it is, man. The website uh, where you can find out stuff about Bodega Brothers, it's bodegabrothers.com. And it's not spelled phonetically. It's actually B-O-D-E-G-A, um, B-R-O-V-A-S.com. That's at 4.30 in the morning sleep. Bodegabrothers.com. Um, we got music on iTunes. We have music on Spotify. Um, I also have solo records that are a little bit older that are on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, and mm-hmm. all that good stuff. Uh, you know, check out what I was talking about back then. But you, man, wait, wait till you, what you hear me talk about next. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's definitely good stuff. BG, you, how can the people reach us? Well, first we gotta say thank you, man. We we, we, we did we this did. one. We stepped it up a little bit. We actually we in the studio today, so yeah, this is nice. I thought this is how y'all normally roll. No, no we, this ain't how we normally roll. <laughs> you talking about being in that mail room and oh, sticking man. it? Yeah, man. <laughs> this, 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 this next level. So we hustle just like you hustle. Bro. We stepped it up. That's what's yeah. about. I, I appreciate. No like, problem. Pulled out the good shine. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, brought to you by the good folks at Bravo Ocean Studios, Nick and the guys for getting the set up. So we really do appreciate them. As far as, oh yeah, you guys oh, yeah, oh definitely. Uh shout out to Nick and to um uh this studio, man. It's nice. I mean, if you in the Atlanta area, uh, I know a lot of you like to uh, get in the studio, record, definitely come out to this studio. Uh it's really nice. Nick does a really good job. That's a piano, piano. Live, That's a piano instrumentation. <laughs> Garrett, Escobar, getting us hooked up today. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So I just want to make sure we get them they proper do. Yeah. If you want to get in contact with us, check out these podcasts and all our other content. Freelunchpodcast.com. Also on Twitter, you got comments. You want to let us know how you feel about this episode or any other ones. Free Lunch Pod C. Instagram, we'll have some videos and pictures up for that. And be sure to check us on YouTube, Free Lunch TV. Hey, crap. Yes, sir. We labeled ourselves as the hottest podcast duo from the South. Our network, the New South Movement Network, is a network of podcasts. We got four right now. We building on. They got another one coming on deck. I am your boy, Tight. That is BG, the 2 7 kid. Yeah, yeah. And we got. Oh, uh, head crack, man. I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I'm here. <laughs> and this is the Freelance Podcast. Uh, we out of here. <laughs>